Thank you so much, Dr. Maithili, for that kind introduction. And it's wonderful uh, to be amongst all of you stalwarts. And uh, my topic is, uh, I mean, basically, this is the best of ISPAD. So this was one of the sessions that was discussed at ISPAD. And I do understand. Uh, can you see my screen? And am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You are yeah. visible. So, um, I understand that uh, this is the best of ISPAD and uh, this is one of the topics that was discussed at the ISPAD conference in Abu Dhabi. Um, the disclaimer is that it may look very complicated because we live in a very diverse country uh, where uh, there are times where people cannot even afford two square meals to, uh, you know, um, there is a lot of excess in terms of food and therefore uh, the, you know, the counseling and how much you're really going to communicate to the patient has to be really very personalized and individualized. So on that note, I'd like to start my session. Uh, my, the outline for my talk is discussing carbohydrate counting, the effect of fat and protein on blood glucose, discussing strategies for managing high fat and or high protein foods and discussing strategies for managing high GI foods. Um, whenever a person with, uh, you know, type 1 diabetes comes to us, type 1 diabetes is very different to type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes or pre-diabetes. And um, uh, these children, we actually, they're in their growth and developmental phase. And therefore, it's very important that, uh, you know, first, thing that we always counsel them on is healthy eating. Uh, we do not really deprive them of certain foods because um, they need to take insulin. And if they take insulin for their carbohydrates and for their food, uh, they can achieve good glycemic control. So always the counseling will begin with healthy foods because these parents are very worried when they come to us saying that, you know, now my child can't eat rice, can't eat banana, can't eat mango. And they feel very, very depressed and upset about it. So therefore, we always start for all children with healthy eating and the principles of healthy eating. And we tell them that it is no different to any other child of the same age, because today we're also concerned about childhood diabetes as well as childhood obesity. Then we move on to carbohydrate counting. So because, you know, these parents only know about food, they do not understand which food has carbs, protein, fat, and therefore the information that is being passed to them, the knowledge that has to be communicated has to be done in a phase-wise manner. And then we all know that carbohydrates are the main nutrient that affect glucose levels, and uh, therefore, they need to be counted because carbohydrates can have an immediate effect on the blood glucose levels. Again, from the olden days where, you know, the conventional insulin, we were always giving food for the insulin because of constant fear of hypoglycemia. Today, we're giving insulin for the food and therefore, the child, if the child is less hungry, the child takes less insulin. If the child is more hungry, the child takes more insulin. And therefore, we can minimize hypoglycemia as well as ensure that there is lesser glycemic variability. Again, uh, we start with the ICR. Again, it can be different for different times of the day. In the morning, there is more resistance, so the child could need more insulin, whereas in the evening, because of the physical activity, etc., the resistance goes down, child becomes more sensitive to insulin, and therefore the ICR could change. And therefore, it's very important to, you know, start with a number and then work on it, uh, you know, looking at the trends. And I think today we're very fortunate to have technology. We have CGMS, we have uh, SMBG, and that really helps uh, guide decision making. And again, when we're looking at carbs, and I think in India, you know, though I have written carb counting books, I always have a disclaimer that it cannot be 100% accurate. Because if you look at India, we are so diverse. Again, North is so different to East and West and, uh, you know, South, because in certain communities, they add sugar or jaggery, which will increase the carbohydrate count. Again, our roti sizes are so different. And then we are, we cannot get 100% accuracy. But then there are studies which have shown that inaccuracy up to 20% will not really make a big difference in terms of achieving good, you know, optimal glucose control. And therefore, we do get a good postprandial blood glucose level, even with that 20% inaccuracy. And therefore, it's constant teaching of the parents and the children in terms of trying to get the carbohydrate counting right. And therefore, SMBG and CGMS definitely helps us guide decision making. And therefore, like, you know, um, Dr. Mohan and a lot of other speakers said that, you know, type 1 diabetes requires constant, uh, you know, follow up monitoring and where you could see maybe one person, uh, you know, or maybe 10 people with type 2 diabetes, that kind of time is required for a child with type 1 diabetes, because we have to look at the CGMS trends and therefore make our, uh, you know, um, decisions based on those trends. 
again when we're looking at foods you know often they do their carb counting right they've got it all right but they see that you know with the same amount of carbs the blood glucose levels post prandial are different and therefore with the same quantity of carbs there is a different blood glucose response and therefore that leaves the person very confused that where did i go wrong did i do something wrong but each food there are so many other factors so when we're looking at carb counting yes that is just one part of the story but that is not the only part and therefore all carbs are not the same we all know that different carbs will elicit a different response and therefore we have to go beyond carbohydrate counting now factors that affect meal time insulin dosage there are so many of them right from fasting to pre meal blood glucose levels what is the glucose level does do they need a correction for that glucose time of the day like i said you know morning they have more insulin resistance and therefore they would need more insulin compared to the evening time dose timing most patients take their insulin just before the meal or even after the meal that could also impact the postprandial blood glucose response carb counting accuracy we've already spoken about glycemic index of foods because each food will elicit a different glycemic response the protein content of the meal the fat content of the meal the fiber content type of insulin whether it's a regular acting insulin whether it's a rapid acting insulin or whether it's a fast acting insulin the activity you know if the child has done an activity the blood blood glucose response will be very different and therefore that also needs to be factored in we see gastroparesis stress has a huge impact menses alcohol and illness so there are so many factors so if you look at it it's just not carbs it's not only food there could be so many other factors that can impact the blood glucose control and this was a very interesting study where they actually saw that taking the insulin uh, you know just before the meal or you know just before starting the meal to versus taking 20 minutes post the meal and then taking it 20 minutes prior to the meal so when they took the insulin 20 minutes prior to the meal the blood glucose was you know uh, a uh, post prandial blood glucose response was much better and therefore it, bolus timing is very important and this is one thing that we always emphasize with our patients even if they are on rapid acting insulins um again we have challenging foods so for most home cooked meals it's fine but when they go out and we encourage our children to go for birthday parties to go for picnics uh, you know to enjoy uh, you know a regular life that any other child would uh, have you know where they would go and meet friends and eat out and therefore that is where the biggest challenge happens because these foods are typically very high in fat and protein at times and therefore the blood glucose levels will remain high through the night especially if they've eaten it in the night you know at dinner then usually we see that the, the next morning and sometimes even to the next day afternoon the glucose levels tend to be on the higher side so therefore when we're looking at protein and fat in moderate amounts we always emphasize you know as uh, dietitians we always talk about adding protein and fat and fiber to the meals because that helps to blunt the post meal blood glucose response and therefore for most of our home cooked meals we only you know do carb counting we really don't go to protein and fat counting because they really do not have a very high amount of fat or protein that will actually impact the blood glucose response but when we're looking at a high fat which is more than 20 grams or a high protein which is more than 25 to 30 grams this can slow down the breakdown of carbohydrate from the meal causing delayed hyperglycemia for up to 3 to 8 hours and therefore there is a fall so basically when they given when they give the insulin up front before the meal we see that the blood glucose levels post meal usually go down and then it starts rising later which a very good example is of an ice cream because when the child will eat an ice cream we see that okay after 2 hours the blood glucose levels have come down but then it starts rising again at around 3 to 4 hours and it keeps going high so therefore in most individuals it is necessary to consider additional dosing for meals containing more than 20 grams of fat or more than 25 to 30 grams of protein and again this is very individualized different sensitivities of fat like we know that you know the icrs can change for different times of the day each individual will have a different icr and similar the response for fat and protein as well and therefore frequent blood glucose monitoring or cgms in such situations is recommended now again this was a very interesting study done by kristen bell i'm actually in sydney and i met uh, shantel and this is a study that was done by them where they try to understand that is there of you know the quality of fat is it saturated fat versus unsaturated fat will it have any kind of an impact and they saw that the type of fat did not really make a difference but as the amount of fat increased insulin requirements definitely increased and there they 
saw that, you know, if it's 20 grams of fat in the meal, it will need additional 6% of insulin, whereas 60 grams of fat in a meal, which is purely very high fat, it would need more than 21% insulin additional bolus, uh, 49 to 51% over 105 minutes as dual wave bolus. Again, this was a very interesting thing because uh, does protein really have an impact? And this study actually showed that if a meal contains more than 75 grams to 100 grams of protein, uh, we see that the blood glucose starts rising up to three to five hours after the meal with a mean difference of 36 milligram per DL. And this will have a similar impact of 20 grams of fat. And therefore, bolusing for a meal, which has got a very high amount of protein, especially when we look at our Western population, where they eat a large piece of steak, you know, which has got a lot of protein, it would have an impact. And therefore, 75 grams and 100 grams of protein only meals will increase the blood glucose levels at five hours. Again, therefore, it supports the need for insulin dosing for large amounts of protein. Now, this is again a very interesting study that is done by my friend Kamil Smart, where they saw the impact of a low fat, low protein meal. So basically, four grams of fat and five grams of protein, it wouldn't really have an impact on the blood glucose levels. But when the fat and the protein levels went up to around 35 grams of fat and 40 grams of protein, they saw that the, you know, the impact on blood glucose levels was significantly greater from 150 minutes. At one at five hours, the mean glucose excursion for the high fat, high protein meal was 97 milligram per DL higher than the low fat, low protein meal. And therefore, again, it can, you know, this shows that it can cause late hyperglycemia between three to five hours. And therefore, this will need an extended bolus with additional amount of insulin. Again, adding protein to a carb counting meal, we always emphasize on that because it helps to prevent post meal hypoglycemia, especially post activity. Now, therefore, it leaves the person very confused that what do I do? You know, what to do in such a situation? I want to eat out. I want to go for that birthday party. I want to go for that dinner. But my blood glucose levels seems to be very, very high through the next day. And that really leaves me upset. And today we have enough evidence to show that, you know, additional bolusing for fat and protein definitely helps achieve good glycemic control. Again, this is a very interesting study where they saw that low fat meal will basically give you a very good, you know, post meal blood glucose response versus if you take a normal bolus for a high fat meal, the glucose levels tend to be higher post meal. Again, 30% additional dose up front. So if you take an additional dose of insulin up front, what will happen is the blood glucose levels will go low and that is again not desirable. However, they saw that when you give a 30% additional dose three hours later, the blood glucose levels seem to be in range. So again, this study, you know, supports the fact that you need to give an additional dose, but again, as extended bolus. So again, how do you do this? So basically, it, uh, you know, clearly a lot of evidence, a lot of studies, especially done, uh, you know, by Carmel Smart and Kristen Bell, which have shown that taking 30% of the dose for a very high protein meal and up to 60% more for a high fat, high protein meal may be required. Again, this is what, you know, the studies are showing, but we always tell our patients to start slow in type 1 diabetes and when on insulin, less is more. And therefore, start small, start with 20% increment in terms of insulin. Look at the CGMS trends, do the blood glucose levels at regular intervals. And then along with the physician, the diabetes educator and the dietitian, we ask our patients to then take a you know decision in terms of whether they need additional dose of insulin or just taking 20% extra is enough. Uh, again, very important is if they're having an activity afterwards or if they're going to consume alcohol, especially today we have our teenagers, you know, especially after the age of 18 and 19, they start socializing, taking alcohol. Again, that can cause a delayed hypoglycemia. Now, these are some of the examples. So therefore, as I said, our home cooked meals may not really have an impact, but if the child is going out and having a burger or, uh, you know, pizza or a burrito bowl or, you know, today our children like to go out and experiment with different cuisines or even a Mughlai meal or an Italian meal, it definitely has an impact, uh, you know, on the blood glucose levels. Now, when we're looking at, you know, uh, patients who are on the insulin pump, basically, we, you know, for a high protein with carbohydrate, uh, studies have shown that if you do a division of 60-40, you know, so you're taking 60% of insulin up front and 40% as extended or dual wave bolus or a 70-30 split over two to three hours, it usually works well. Whereas a high protein, high fat with carbohydrate, a 60-40 split over three hours, 
you know, does well in terms of achieving good postprandial uh, glycemic control. Now, for example, a pizza, we know a pizza is high fat, it's also got high carbs. And therefore, we see that the blood glucose levels tend to stay higher for around four to five hours. So here, if the person is on an insulin pump, dual wave or a combination bolus, which is 60-40 or 70-30 split over three hours usually works. But again, this is not something that would work in everybody. And therefore, CGM, as we constantly, you know, try and get the data from the person and try and understand that what is the right uh, you know, split that works for this individual and what is the duration that the split really needs to be done. So what is the best bolus split for high fat, high protein meal? Again, it varies from meal, meal to meal. It will vary from individual to individual. And it will also vary from day to day, depending on the activity, depending on all the other factors that we discussed in the previous slide. Now, again, if you look at ADA or ISPAD guidelines, ISPAD 2022 guidelines, as well as ADA says that you start with carbohydrate counting and then move on to FRAT and protein gram estimation. And that is, again, very important when we're looking at achieving good glycemic control. And today we're all not talking about time and range. And if you want to achieve good time and range, then definitely carbohydrate counting, moving on to protein and fat counting would help. Again, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, method that is, uh, you know, from Poland, which talks about fat protein units. So basically deliver the normal bolus for the carbohydrate content of the meal. And then you calculate the additional insulin requirements for fat and protein using the fat protein unit. So what is fat protein unit? So one fat protein unit is 100 kilocalories of fat and or protein. So that becomes a 10 gram equivalent of carbohydrate. And then you deliver the additional insulin for FPUs and as an extended bolus for around three to eight hours. Again, very important is to test the BGs at two hours, four hours, six hours, and eight hours. So for any meals which have got high fat and protein, monitoring at a regular basis is, becomes very, very important. Again, when we're looking at extended bolus duration, so for one fat protein unit, you extend the time by three hours. For two fat protein unit, you extend it by four hours. For three, by five hours, and anything above three, to up to eight hours. But very important is to check the basal rates because if the person is on insulin uh, pump and if the basal rates are high or the ICR, uh, you know, is also very high, the person is at a higher risk of going into hypoglycemia. And therefore, people are very wary about using this method because they have to get a very high level of accuracy with this method. Now, what are the other strategies when we're looking at MDI? Because most of our patients are on in, in India are on MDIs. So how do we, you know, what does, what do the studies and what does evidence say in terms of MDIs? So consider decreasing the mealtime dose to prevent early post-meal lows and give additional dose of rapid-acting insulin. Of course, this is suggested by the physician one to two hours post-meal to mimic the combination bolus. But for this, the person has to be willing to take two you know, two shots of insulin, which we see as the biggest, uh, you know, reluctance from the patient because the person really doesn't want to take an additional shot of insulin. Again, what we've also seen is that for slower, more sustained response, a short acting insulin in such cases, especially when they're eating a high fat meal may work better than a rapid or a fast acting insulin. Now, when it comes to a pump user, add additional 15 to 35% to the bolus dose using extended bolus. Again, consider amount of carb in the meal, activity level, alcohol, and therefore take very cautious, careful decisions. Or alternatively, we can do a temporary basal increase and or an additional bolus two hours later. Today, with the advanced hybrid closed loop systems, automatically this is done because you really do not have to set the dual wave or the uh, square wave. Automatically, the pump will give an extra basal, uh, you know, will increase the basal rate uh, depending on the blood glucose. Uh, you know, the levels that the CGMS actually uh, feeds into the pump. Again, when we're coming to your high uh, GI foods, again, for breakfast, if the child is having cornflakes or having bread, we typically see that the post-meal blood glucose levels tend to be very, very high. One is because they already have some level of resistance and on that they're eating a very, very high GI food. So for this early preprandial insulin administration uh, works well. Reduce the total carb amount and we always emphasize on adding protein and fat and fiber to the meal because that will help to blunt the glycemic uh, response. Consider food order. So basically starting the meal with protein and fiber and then moving on to the carbs. 
If the person has done an insulin pump, there is something called a super bolus, which really works well, wherein you borrow the basal for the next two hours, you add it to your bolus dose, and then you give that 15 minutes before the meal starts. And that really works well, especially when it comes to a high GI meal. With advanced hybrid closed loop systems, again, this is taken care because automatically the pump will sense that the glucose levels are going high and automatically increase the uh, rate of the basal. So in summary, type 1 diabetes management calls for a multidisciplinary approach. Very important is to involve the person with diabetes, the caregivers, the physician, a qualified dietitian, again, uh, somebody who's trained to see children with type 1 diabetes, because again, everybody has a different specialization. And this requires a very high degree of specialization, especially when we're looking at uh, protein and fat counting and educator psychologists. And it has to be very stepwise. It's not a one size fits all. Again, we do not, we would not really teach protein and fat counting to everybody. We will see, uh, you know, how much is the person being able to understand at least the basics, then move on to carb counting and then move on to protein and fat counting. And it has to be, as everybody is discussing, it has to be a part of a structured education package. Uh, high fat and or protein requires more insulin with some insulin up front and additional insulin as extended bolus. And for high GI meals, early pre-bolus or a super bolus on the pump. So thank you so much for your patient, dear.